Hey everyone, this is Tammy Painter, and you're listening to the Book Owl Podcast, the podcast where I entertain your inner book nerd with tales of quirky books and literary lore. And holy moly, it seems like forever since I've been in front of the microphone. I don't even know what episode number we're on at this point. It's been so long. I, I think it's 27. I hope it's 27. So I'm just going to go with 27. And if it's not too bad, it's 27 now. I also hope I remember how to do all the processing to get this thing to you. Otherwise, this would be a little pointless. So April for me was a weird month. And I cover why that is in my writing update. And if you want more details, there'll be a link in the show notes. And I know you've really missed me saying that, right? But suffice it to say that things went a little wacky medically, personally, and with my writing stuff. And because of all that weirdness, I had a lot of trouble getting into a book. I can't even tell you how many novels I started and just gave up on. Even audiobooks weren't capturing my attention. And who knows, maybe it wasn't me. Maybe they were just really crappy books, but I think it was mostly me. Either way, what I did find myself gravitating toward were graphic novels. And specifically French graphic novels, because my library's online doohickey thingy added a whole bunch of them to their system. So I thought, well, one, yay, I can practice a little bit of my French. And two, what a perfect topic for the podcast after its long spring break. So just to let you know, this episode is going to specifically be about French comics, or, you know, as they're known over there, les bandes désignées. These are, this episode is not going to be about American comic books, although they do play a part in the story. All right, so I know you're on the edge of your seat wondering what in the world the term bande désignée translates to, right? Well, it actually in English translates literally to drawn strips. But if you're cool, you shorten bande désignée to bay day. But to me, that kind of sounds like B-Day, so I'm just going to call them B-D from now on for, for the most part. These are also known as Franco-Belgian con- comics. Con- con- I almost said con men. <laughs> These are also known as Franco-Belgian comics because they got their start in Belgium, where they were known as Stripverhalen, or strip stories. And to me, Both of those kind of sound like the name for like a strip club newsletter, but you know, that's just where my mind goes. Um, Anyway, these Belgian comics, if they were written in Flemish, would then be translated into French and, you know, exported to France where they were crazy popular. So the early versions of these comics, which they began in like the mid to late 1800s, they were a little different from their American cousins because the... American comics around that time, they were mainly used in a political way to mock or to criticize the government or, you know, various people who were trying to push their weight around. France and Belgium took a more lighthearted approach and kept theirs mostly humorous and kind of for kids, but, you know, they were kind of adult-centered too. And obviously you'd recognize these uh, comics as comics if you saw them, but they were a little different than what we're used to today. There was usually only one panel or a very short strip of panels, and there were no word bubbles. It was like they hadn't come up with that idea yet, so the comics would have captions like what people were used to seeing under you know, photographs and magazines. So eventually, someone comes around and flips the calendar page, and it's the 1900s. Comics start appearing in a more episodic nature in magazines or newspapers, and that means that each issue built on the story started in the previous issue. These were pretty popular amongst French readers, but none of these comics from this early, early, early time period really took off outside of France. And to be honest, I can't blame people for not just clamoring for these things. Because one of the more pervasive series of comics was put out by the Catholic Church's Union of French Catholic Workers. And I hope I translated that right because, like, the resource only had it in French. So I think I have that union right. Anyway, these comics were geared toward kids, supposedly. 
and they covered that kid favorite topic of health and correct behavior. Yeah, I know, gripping stuff, right? But even though things were kind of limping along on the popularity scale, in the 1920s, we finally start to see word bubbles in France. Hurrah! Although they had been popping up, see what I did there? Popping up in the US, the first French artist to use word bubbles was Alain saint Again, and that is like such a tongue twister. Unfortunately, the French, they can be stubborn about changing their ways, and the caption format still continue to dominate comics for, like, at least another couple decades. Seriously, slow adopters. Moving along to 1930, we finally have a breakout hit, and we also have the first true Belgian bande dessinée. Or do we? So, as I said, these comics were coming out in episodic form in periodicals. One of these periodicals was called Le XXe Siècle, and they eventually, around this time, put the artist Hergé in charge of a new supplement for kids called Le Petit XXe. And in this supplement, Hergé began the story of an adventurous character named Tintin, or we'll just say Tin Tin, because that's going to be easier for me to say over and over. Well, Tin Tin was so popular, the newspaper decided to put his first complete story into a hardcover book and claimed it was the first BD published. Which was a total lie, because the publisher Hachette had already published their own BD of the comic Zig et Pus um, a year or two earlier. But that wasn't Tintin's only controversy. See, Le Ventium was a very conservative magazine. And as conservatives like to do, they just loved to drive home their fascist and far-right views. And some of these views made their way into the Tintin comics. And I say made, and I don't know if it was forced upon or if this was a collaborative decision or what, but... They made their way into the Tin Tin comics, which included a lot of racial slurs and a lot of stereotypes. Hergé wasn't exactly cool with this, but he went along with it anyway. And I imagine, like, you know, this is a time period when, you know, the world economy is kind of in not the most stable situation. So maybe he didn't want to lose his job. I don't know. I'm not making excuses for him, but I'm just trying to get, you know, kind of a mindset. But, um... He did go along with it, but he did later apologize for his betrayal of African people and Jews and apologize for a whole lot of other stuff. Although he never did apologize for taking credit for claiming Tintin was the first BD. Some people, right? But credit where credit is due. Although Tintin wasn't the first BD, it was the first to gain popularity outside of France and Belgium. And by 1934, Tintin, and, you know, I would assume Hergé, moved on to a new publisher. They were selling all over the place, and they'd been translated into dozens of languages. And, I don't know, 1934 must have been a popular year for comics, because it's during this year that we also see the publication of the eight-page BD, Le Journal de Mickey. And yes, that's Mickey Mouse, not some other Mickey. It was an instant success, and publishers, not being stupid, quickly brought over more American cartoon characters and tossed them into the pages of their own periodicals and BD. But all didn't continue going quite so splendidly for those U.S. characters. So in the early 1940s, there was this little skirmish called World War II. You might have heard of it. And during this skirmish, Germany, they got all grabby and invaded France and Belgium and, you know, a few other places. And because the Americans weren't telling Germany what a great job they did with those invasions, the Germans put a ban on all U.S. comics and cartoon characters because they questioned the morals of those fictional characters. Yes, the regime who invented concentration camps said Superman had questionable morals. Right, okay. Anyway, as you might expect, this only made the French and Belgians want comics even more. 
since it was really tricky and probably pretty dangerous to get your hands on American comics, young French and Belgian artists seized the chance to fill the need for some levity. These young artists emulated the American style and stories to learn the ropes, but eventually they created their own characters and their own style. And if you're kind of a nerd for comics or BD or just cartoons in general, you'll probably recognize a couple artists from this time period. I mean, there's more than a couple, but I don't want to spend this whole podcast listing names. But a couple of them are Peo, who would go on to create the Smurfs, and Albert Uderzo, who created the Asterix and Obelix comics. Uh, so, yay, we're up to the late 1940s and the war is over. Unfortunately, it's not quite over for comics. See, during the war, those young artists I mentioned, they gained a lot of status. Their, you know, their products, their BD, they were really popular. And they had probably kept morale up for many people. So they were rewarded for this by being tossed into prison. Yes, seriously. When the new French government came into place after the war... It was mostly made up of people who had been strong players in the resistance. Well, they claimed that these artists could only have done well during a time of war by collaborating with the Germans. Which, you know, kind of proves that conspiracy theories are nothing new. And American comics weren't faring any better in post-war France than they did during the German occupation. The Communist Party of France reinstated the ban on American comics because they saw them as promoting capitalism and non-communist ideals. I mean, just look at Bruce Wayne, that mansion, the Batmobile, a freaking butler. Clearly his main goal wasn't to fight crime as Batman, it was to subvert the communist cause. It's so obvious. Anyway, during this time, many French artists hightailed it to Belgium to avoid scrutiny. And many French magazines that contained comics, they just didn't survive the war. And they also started failing during this post-war period because of all these restrictions and, you know, arrests and things like that. People just didn't want to take the chance, so there weren't showing up in magazines. So who knows how many comic hijinks we missed out on. But by the 1950s, most of the accused artists had had their names cleared and were released from prison. And it's around this time that um, Tintin and other BD really start to gain a foothold across the globe. And it's also in the 1950s, um, 1959 to be exact, that the French periodical Pilote published something to attract teenage readers. And that something was Asterix. And if you don't know Asterix, he's this scrappy little Gaul from the time of the Roman invasion of France, or Gaul. And it's one of my absolute favorites, mainly due to the tongue-in-cheek humor, which unfortunately, it doesn't always come across in the English translations, especially with the character names. So if you can read French, do opt for that version instead. But it's still funny if you read in English, so don't not read it just because it's only in English or whatever your preferred language is. And I like Asterix and Obelix so much. Uh, and if you don't know Obelix, he's um, Asterix's friend who's very, very rotund. <laughs> it's very funny. Um, but I like them so much. I named my guinea pigs for them because one is kind of small and scrappy and the other is just huge and fat and kind of dumb, but nice. Anyway, moving on to the 60s and into the 70s, social norms really start changing in the world. This is also when some of those people who might have been kids when Tintin and Asterix came out were now becoming adults. And as such, and because there's just this huge increase in BD artists, we start seeing far more adult BD and more adults reading BD, as well as an increase in comic periodicals such as Le Canard Sauvage. So even though one source I used to research this episode said the 1980s saw a steep decline in BD, I'm not quite sure if that's accurate, because in 1982, the French government recognized the importance of BD 
to France's cultural status and its usefulness in promoting a French product to the world. And making it even more clear that BD were not in the decline, the French Minister of Culture declared comic art was a true art form, and it became known as the Neuvième Art, or Ninth Art, in his policy plan called 15 New Measures in Favor of the Comic. And you gotta love a measure with a title like that. Um, Again, BD were so not in decline that this policy plan was actually revamped and strengthened in the late 1990s. Belgium was a little slower to adopt comic book art as a true art form in its own right, but eventually they did, and for a long time, France and Belgium were the only two countries in the world to recognize comic art as legitimate art and to give it backing by cultural authorities. And the Belgians, even though they were a little behind at first, really went all in with this comics are a great idea thing and built what is the largest comic book museum in the world. It's in Brussels and it's called the Belgium Comic Strip Museum, although I think they probably make that into French, but I didn't write that one down. So we're just going to go with Belgium Comic Strip Museum. It opened in 1989 and receives an average of 200,000 visitors a year. And I'm going to assume that's a non-pandemic year. If they're receiving 200,000 visitors in a pandemic year, wow, they are really popular. Um, So after the 1990s, BD only increased in popularity. And I will tell you, BD obsession is alive and well. I went to France in the fall of 2019, and... Our last night we spent in Paris just to be near the airport, but we went into Paris center and one of my goals was to find this bookstore that had, it was, you know, just a comic book bookstore kind of thing, but not with a weird comic book guy like the Simpsons. And it took a little while to find it because I didn't realize there was three different branches of this bookstore. And it, one just carried sort of novels and other kind of books, and the other carried mostly stationary supplies. Finally, we found the comic book one, or the BD one. And uh, I will tell you, that place, and this was maybe 7 or 8 o'clock at night. I don't know, it was pretty late, but it was wall-to-wall adults shopping for comic books, or graphic novels, or BD, whatever you want to call them. So... These things aren't going away anytime soon, at least in France. And yes, after much debate and probably spending more time in the store than we spent in all of Paris on this little excursion, I did end up getting uh, a Smurfs comic uh, BD, sorry, and uh, an Asterix BD. And I also picked up another Asterix BD on the way out while we were at the airport. It's because, you know, you got to stock up while you're away, right? So... With that tale, that's all I've got for BD, which means it is update time. So, as you can already hear, the podcast is back. As I mentioned before the break, I had intended to do video book reviews while I was sort of away from the microphone, and I ended up doing one. I'm telling you, April was a weird month, not a very productive one. Um, but I do have a couple more and they are going to, they'll either be up on my YouTube channel by the time this comes out or they'll be coming out very soon. Uh, I've been doing a lot of video stuff lately. So if you'd like a bit of video goofiness, if the audio goofiness isn't enough for you, you should probably subscribe to my channel because I guess that's what I'm supposed to tell you to do to make the YouTube gods happy. Also, this week, just a couple days ago, I released the third book in my Cassie Black trilogy. Now, if you're listening to this before the end of May 2021, I am doing a pretty nice discount on book one of the trilogy to celebrate the launch of book three. And that first book in the trilogy is The Undead Mr. Tenpenny. It's only 99 cents on most retailers, but like I said, it's only going to be until the end of the month. So you've got like, if you're listening to this on release day, you've got like 10 days. And if you're not listening to this on release day, you have even fewer days. So get cracking if you want to get that deal. 
As for the new book, the new book is called The Untangled Cassie Black, and I can't really tell you much about it because it's a trilogy, and it's a trilogy that is meant to be read in order. So if I tell you what's going on in this book, you'll know what happened in the other books, and that would give it all away, and I just don't want to do that. But I can read you the book description. I don't think that's going to give too much away. It gives a little bit away, but it's not terrible. Anyway, so The Untangled Cassie Black. Sometimes taking an overdose of magic is the least of your worries. Cassie Black has just lost two people through a magic portal. Her arch enemy, the Mauve, is threatening to destroy city after city if HQ doesn't hand her over to him. And HQ isn't exactly saying no to that offer. As HQ debates her fate, Cassie refuses to sit by and watch the grass grow between the toes of the surveillance gnomes. Biting back her life rule to never get involved, she knows the only way to stop the Mauve is to go after him herself. Which is exactly what he wants. Because the instant Cassie falls into his hands, the Mauve will gain the unlimited power he's always craved. So don't get captured, right? Easy for you to say. Trouble is, there's a traitor within HQ who's proving to be far more devious, more powerful, and to have more tricks up the sleeve than anyone could have ever guessed. In this page-turning conclusion of the Cassie Black trilogy, the curses are flying, the pastries are plentiful, the bookworms are slithering, and the magical batteries are charged to capacity. And it's also available on most ebook retailers. And it's also available as a paperback and a hardback, and there'll be links and all that kind of stuff in the show notes. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining me again. If you like what you've heard, you can support the show by buying any one of my books. And if you do buy one of my books, be sure to leave a review. That really is the best way to support any indie author and your favorite podcast. I am your favorite, right? Right? Hello? Ah, well. Have a great couple weeks, everyone, and I will hoot at you next time. The Book Owl Podcast is a production of Daisy Dog Media, copyright 2021, all rights reserved. The theme music was composed by Kevin McLeod, audio processing by ophonic.com, video production by headliner.app.